my heart is there to stay. Hallelujah, I'm going home. Glory, hallelujah, I am going home. Go away, God, you're never more to roam. I am not complaining every day, I'm gaining glory. Hallelujah, I am going home. Glory forever, I am in this way to win. Jesus completely saves me from all. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. Let's stand and we'll turn to page number 163. Page 163, My Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the to set me free sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt that last verse with the music when we get to the course we'll sing that course a cappella and sing out on the course when we get there ready on the fourth i will sing of my redeemer and his heavenly love to me he from death to life hath brought me son of god with him to be sing it out Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. 
on the cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Page 666, my Jesus, I love thee. ready to sing this song as I want you to think about the words of this song I tell you the the choir brother Gage can you give me some more volume up here please sir the choir this morning is full and it sounds good and uh, I if I'm not careful I'll, I'll get caught up in listening to the harmony and listening to you people sing and I, I won't even think about what we're singing I'm convinced that more lies are told in church during the song service than any other time. Now think about what we're going to sing here. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. I wonder how many people really mean what they're singing when we sing this song. I want you to think about it this morning. Sing it from your heart. Um, I think music can be a form of worship, but it's not always a form of worship. This morning, let's worship together as we sing about our Savior. Let's sing about how we love Him. The Bible says we love Him only because He first loved us. Aren't you glad He loved you, gave Himself for you? He's worthy of our love, don't you think? Don't you think? So let's just blend our voices together as one big choir this morning. And let's sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior. Sing the last verse a cappella. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I don't want you 
want you to stop singing this morning. It's just beautiful. I'm so, so thankful to be in this place this morning and be able to hear these songs. We're going to sing page 448, My Savior's Love. Now, this is a, typically, it's a, it's a fast-paced, peppy song. And I want Brother Dowdy just to pick a couple of verses here, just your two favorite verses, Brother Dowdy. And I want to do it a cappella. Maybe, maybe do the first verse with music, but then after that, let's do it a cappella. And uh, just lift your voices. I, sometimes, I don't know what it is exactly. I, I can't put my finger on it. Sometimes the, the sound of God's people singing reminds me of, of when I was a kid in a little small church down in Ludowisi, Georgia, Faith Baptist Church in Ludowisi, Georgia. And uh, they were all just old, creaky wood pews. And um, there was, seems like there was carpet underneath the pews, but down the aisles there was, there was just hardwood. It was all paneling in, in the auditorium. It was all, just all, all wood. And I remember on revival weeks, uh, we'd pack that place full of people. And uh, they, they'd start singing some of these songs, Revive Us Again. And I'm telling you, the place would just, would just ring you know, with, with the voice of God's people. Now, somebody said recently, I think it was Brother Dowdy, referred to the human voice as probably God's greatest musical instrument. He created it. I think we'll be willing to use it for him. And so when God's people get together to sing about something they all believe in, and I'm telling you, when we blend our voices, it's, i got to believe it's pleasing in our Savior's ear. Now, you're in a place this morning where it's easy to do that. You try to go to work tomorrow and stand there and sing a cappella, My Jesus, I love thee. You're going to get some looks. You will. Not this morning. You're going to get some looks if you don't sing with us. So you might as well join in. Let's sing this song, My Savior's Love. Just follow Brother Dowdy, and he'll tell us what to do when we do it, okay? First verse. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall going to sing the fourth verse as the last. When we get to the chorus, we'll sing the chorus a cappella. We're going to slow it down just a little bit on the fourth. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me on the course how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me Our Father, we're so thankful for the love that you've bestowed upon us. Or as you tell us in 1 John, what manner of love the Father's bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Lord, the most impressive verse or word in that verse is the word we. God, I know who I am. I know my heart. Lord, that you would love me in such a way that I could call you Father. It's, it's a wonder to me. God, thank you for it. Now, Lord, we have... We tried our best to prepare for today. And now, God, we look to you to take all that we've done. Lord, all of our effort is worthless if you don't bless it. So, God, would you please be in every detail of this service. You know every individual that's here. You know the burdens they've come in with. You know the struggles that have been had this week. 
So, Lord, I pray that you would make this service into what it needs to be, to be used by your gracious hand to administer it to each and every single person. Well, thank you, Father. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated as the choir sings.
Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing page number 160. Are you washed in the blood? Page 160. And on the second verse, turn around and greet someone this morning. Page 160. Have you been to Jesus, Lord? You washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, or are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Turn around, greet someone this morning. And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless or are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You may be seated this morning. Now, I have announced for the, for the last several weeks that today we would be taking up a special offering. The entire offering this morning actually goes towards the, uh, the building here. And we're trying to pay down the debt on this building. And uh, we've made quite a bit of headway over the last couple of years. And uh, we stand right now. This is kind of a, people, people get all clammy and awkward when you mention money, especially on a Sunday morning. But I don't, but Pastor Story used to say, if the people don't know of the need, they can't meet the need. So here you go. So here's how we're doing it. We're going to take up the offering this morning. Everything that comes in this offering that is not marked faith missions is going to go right to the building. It's going to go right to pay off the, the, the principal of, of the mortgage. Right now, we, we owe about $186,644 as of two days ago. And um, so, so, so we, need, we need about that much, I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, I sure am glad that, that the, you know, the Bible says that our God didn't just make everything. He owns 
everything. And so, so he's aware of the need, and we're just going to trust him for it. And so you give this morning knowing exactly where it's going. I hope you've prayed about it. I hope you've come this morning to take part in the giving. I know I and my family have done that. And so uh, let's, let's take up the offering right now. Come on, guys, with, with those offering plates, we'll go ahead and get that offering. I am not going to tell you. The, the guys aren't even going to count the offering and until uh, after church. And so if you want to know how much came in, you've got to come back tonight. Uh, that's just the way that goes. And then if I notice that the crowd's really down tonight, I may not even tell you tonight. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But uh, come back tonight, and we'll, we'll tell you what the Lord did this morning. And uh, you, you want to be a part of it. Somebody told me a while ago, uh, they said, I, I don't remember which service it was. Maybe it was Sunday or Wednesday. I don't know which one. They said I was talking about um, the, the old building and, and how the Lord helped us with, with that building and all that. And they said, boy, just hearing the excitement in your voice made me wish I could have been there to be a part of it. And here's what I told them. I said, well, good news. You're here this morning and you get to be a part of this one. And so that's the way you ought to look at it. I'm, I'm thrilled. Hey, you know, in 20 years, we're going to look back on the year 2020. And we're going to be trying to tell our kids and some of our grandkids about how ridiculously crazy it was. We're going to talk about church. We're going to talk about how hard a year it was for the church. Then we're going to say, but then 2021 came. And man, you should have seen what God did in 2021. You'll be able to say, you'll be able to talk about it from uh, my experience. You'll, you'll say, I was there to see it happen. So I'm excited about that. All right, let me make a couple of announcements real quick, and then we'll get this offering uh, next Sunday morning, it's, of course, next Sunday is the 4th of July, and uh, we're doing things a little bit differently this year. We've never done it. We've never done anything like this, and so I'm fully aware that there are some who will be against this. There will be some who are in favor of this. Here's what I will guarantee you. Those who are in favor of what we're going to do are those who are always here from start to finish to do all of the work for the 4th of July event. Those who are not in favor of it are going to be those who don't show up to do any of the work. They just want to come and see the fireworks. That's how this is going to go. But here's what we're going to do. Next Sunday morning, there will be no 10 o'clock hour. Uh, there'll be no 10 o'clock classes downstairs. There'll just be one service. It'll be up here in the auditorium, and it will start at 11 o'clock, just like we normally do, okay? So morning service only at 11 o'clock up here. We'll have our service, and then there'll be a meal prepared downstairs, and uh, I believe it's going to be pulled pork, or I think that's what Brother Jerry told me. And so there'll be a big meal downstairs. And um, the rest of the day, is, we're just going to spend some time fellowshipping with each other. We're going to spend some time with our families. We've got all kinds of games set up outside for, for the kids next week. We've got several inflatables that will be set up outside. There's going to be volleyball, of course, basketball, cornhole, all kinds of games. We've got giant checkers, all, all of those things. Uh, going on outside, Lord willing, weather permitting. And in addition to that, we're also going to have a disc golf course set up outside. And so bring your disc or frisbees. If you're a redneck hick like me, they're still frisbees. Bring your frisbees. You can play with us. And uh, we're also going to have an archery range set up, an archery tournament. So if you bow hunt, or maybe you don't bow hunt, you just know how to really fling an arrow good, you can, you can join us in that tournament if you want. Bring your bows with you, and we'll have it all set up safe. Now here's what I'm asking. I'll announce this again next week, but in case you're not in the audience, next week when I announce it. Don't get your bow out until it's time. I don't, we don't want to have any of those, um, we just don't want to have any incidents. We'll just go, go with that. There'll be people playing things everywhere. We want to make sure that we stay safe and we'll have the course set up in a, in a safe way. In addition to those things, we're also going to have, and I'm personally excited about this, we're also going to be having a baking competition. I don't think we've ever done that here, but here's what I know for sure from personal experience, and my belly will tell you, we have got some phenomenal cooks in our church, and I'm excited to, to see, and I am, I don't care else, who else joins me, I'm probably Brother Dowdy, but I refuse to give up my position as a judge. I will, I will be in the, the judging lineup, and so uh, we're going to have a dessert, a dessert competition, so make your best cake, pies, cookies, brownies, whatever it is you make the best of. Don't go to the store and get Betty Crocker and open the box. Don't do that. Let's get, let's get really, really good about this. Now, some of you older ladies you got to help me out here. You guys are the best cooks in the whole church, and so bring the best thing you've got. And although I will say Desiree Lamar makes a mean no-bake peanut butter cookie. So, um, in fact, we may just go ahead and declare the winner now. I, we, we could, I guess. Um, so anyway, anyway, that'll be going on in the building. We've got some other stuff planned as well. But all day long, we'll be doing stuff outside together. And uh, then about 3.30 or so, we're going to meet back in the auditorium. And uh, we're going to have a lot of music. We're going to have some special, some, some special song. We've got some folks from another church. My brother-in-law, Daniel, uh, he's a pastor down in, in uh, Romulus. And he's a pastor of Hope Baptist Church. They'll be coming out here to be with us during that service. I mean, they're probably going to take part in some of the music. And then in addition to the special music, 
I want it to kind of be like a hymn sing. And uh, so what, I, what I've got here, and we don't, normally we just say, bring up your request, we'll try to sing them. These two, these two side-up sheets are identical. Don't think you've got to find one or the other. They're identical. Uh, they'll both be back there in the foyer after the service. Brother Jerry, help me remember to get those back there. And uh, you can request a hymn that you haven't heard sung in a while, or maybe it's just your favorite hymn. You can write that down on there. If you have someone in the church that sings a special that means something to you, or you have somebody who you want to hear sing, write that down on there. And we'll try to put together as many of those requests as we possibly can, and uh, we'll, it'll, be a, it'll be a good time of fellowship. One thing about Faith Baptist Church of Chelsea is we like good, godly music. It does something for us. I don't ever want to underestimate the value of music. Get in your Bible. From the beginning to the end, you find music. In the book of Genesis, you find people singing. In the book of Job, you find that the Bible talks about singing. All the way to the end of the book of Revelation. Guess what? In heaven, in heaven we're all going to be singing. And I, I say we just get a good jump on it on this side, right? So anyway, next Sunday's going to be a big day. We want you to come and be a part of it. And we're not canvassing neighborhoods, giving out invitations. That's not, no, not doing that this year. But we are inviting you, and I want you to invite anybody that you want to come with you. If you want to get them to, to come and, and enjoy some, some, some time around the church, but also some preaching, and then I would encourage you to invite your friends, your family. Many times people will come to something like that, and when they won't come to a regular church service. So don't miss an opportunity to invite that coworker or whoever it might be that you'd like to see come to church. All right? All in favor, say amen. amen. All right. I'm not asking if you're opposed because that would probably just make me mad this morning. All right. All right. Let's bow our heads. Someone just said my name. Miss Bonnie. No. Miss Deanhofer. No. Miss Elaine. We're getting there. If you want to sit outside, you need lawn chairs. We will have some tables and stuff set outside. We'll have stuff inside as well, um, but we'll have some stuff outside. But if you want a comfortable chair, then bring your lawn chair. And also, um, I was supposed to announce that we need desserts as well, not just for the competition, but we just need lots and lots of desserts. Um, if everything else goes wrong on that day, a bunch of desserts will make it all better, I promise, okay? So let's bring lots of desserts. Brother Jerry, do you need them to sign up or camp count or anything? No? Okay. Just bring your desserts. And if you have questions about anything I've just said about food, Brother Jerry is the go-to man on this. So you talk to him or more than likely Miss Leslie, and uh, they will give you the information you need. Okay? All right. Let's bow our heads. Our God, we come to this part of the service, and Lord, I, I have, uh, Lord, I've talked to you many times about it already. Lord, more than an amount, God, I just want you to get glory. God, it's not about any one person. Or it's not about any group of people. It's about you and you being glorified. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take this offering, and God, would you please do with it that which would give you the most glory, that would exalt you the highest. And Father, we're going to thank you right now for what you're going to do, for we ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Really help musicians. We'll be done with the music. Miss Kim's going to sing for us just before the message this morning. So, so Kim's got a son named Jace. Is that his name? Jace. And um, Kim was in the choir this morning, and I don't know who was responsible for for the boy, but all I know is he escaped. What was that? 
Grandpa Steve with a Lynn was responsible. He escaped at some point, and um, the choir was coming down. He came up here on the platform, was looking right at me, holding a blue hippopotamus, and I didn't know who he was. I didn't recognize him, and uh, I was like, uh, uh, I said, what's your name? And he told me, and I said, what's his name? Pointed the hippo to Pi. Is that his, his name is Pi, okay? Don't know why, but his name was Pi. And uh, I could tell he was not interested in talking to me. He was talking, looking for his mom, and I think he was expecting her to come down. But after it was all said and done, Brother Daddy looked at me, and he's like, that's one of the mom's worst fears to look up and see your child on the platform and not know why. <laughs> If you have your Bibles with you this morning, how about holding them up good and high? Let's see how many we have in here today. Uh, that's great. I hope you brought your Bible with you to church. You can put them down. Someone told me one time, I don't do that all the time, but someone told me one time when I did that, I said, it make me feel like we're in junior church again. Uh, well, that's all right, I think. Brother Dowdy asked me to remind everybody that's going to camp. What time are you all leaving, Brother Dowdy? Is he in here? Miss Dowdy, do you have any idea? Nine, leaving the church at nine. So I think he said there's 24 people going to camp and leaving tomorrow at nine o'clock. All of you that are going, and some of them are downstairs this morning, so you parents that are listening, if you have a kid going to camp in the morning, Brother Dowdy needs to meet with everybody one more time to go over last minute details. You know, meet with you right over here as soon as the service is over. So make sure you run up there and be a part of that meeting. And so you know what's going on. My kids are so excited about, uh, about camp. And um, not for the reason that you might think they are. Um, we have just begun moving back into our house. And uh, my kids know that if they're at camp, they don't have to help unpack and organize and all of that. So they're not excited about going to camp for any spiritual reason. They just want to get out of the unpacking process. Thank you for all of your prayer uh, throughout this whole uh, house fire and rebuilding and all of, all of this. It has been 
Uh, it's been quite the process, and um, I thank you for all the all the offers for help, and, and it's, it's just, it's been overwhelming, really. Uh, we have spent the last two nights there, and um, that's, that sounds really exciting, but the first night we were there, I slept on the couch, because there was nothing set up. The kids had a bed to sleep in, but me and Melody slept on the couch, and um, last night we got, got back in our bed. That was, that was nice, and, uh, but there is, you know, if you've ever moved, you know the you know, the chaos that ensues. Most of you have never experienced what it's like to move with 10 people in the house. And um, that's a whole other element. But um, thank you for, for all the prayers. And uh, we're getting close to back to normal. I have, it has occupied so much of my time in the last, really the last month has just been, I've been around the church so little and I've apologized to Brother Jerry over and over again. I called him last week and I said, look, I know I know the way it looks, but just so you know, I've not forgotten that I'm a pastor. I haven't forgotten that. But if I, we were at a certain point that if the way the restoration was going with the insurance company, if I didn't just start doing things, we would, it would never get done. And so I just had to take time off and go, go get stuff done. And um, so thank you for all of your patience, all of your prayer. And it sure is good to, it sure is good to get back, uh, back at home. All right, let's find, um, well, let's find 1 Kings chapter 8. I want to grab a thought from 1 Kings 8. Then we'll pray. and We're going to run some references. And then if the Lord will help me, I'd like to finish this morning back in 1 Kings chapter 8. So let's look at 1 Kings chapter 8 just before we pray. A little bit, a little bit of a historic background or some context for this passage will help you. Um, I don't know what, what edition, what kind of Bible. I hope it's a King James Bible you have, but I don't know who the publisher is. My Bible has little headings at the top of each page that kind of help sometimes. Maybe your Bible has headings before each chapter, or maybe even put into the chapter different headings that kind of tell you what's going on in, in that portion of Scripture. That, that's good. Those aren't inspired, but they're certainly, they certainly help. Um, this portion of Scripture, your Bible might even tell you, this portion of Scripture is a very exciting portion for the, nation of old, or the, the Old Testament nation of Israel. They have constructed a temple. And it's a temple that has never seen its equal on this earth. It is a temple that even by today's standards would blow the minds of those who behold it. At one point, we, we did a, a study in men's Bible study of the value of the items listed for the tabernacle in the wilderness and then the temple. And um, an expensive commercial property today, last I checked, I don't know about the building prices today, I guess, but in the last couple of years, if you paid $300 a square foot for commercial uh, construction, that was expensive. By today's prices, if we were to calculate the, the cost of the materials that we know went into the temple, uh, we did that one time, and the, the price came to something like $27 million a square foot. I mean, we're talking about something to see. In fact, the temple was so great that after its destruction... Uh, the people of Israel gathered back in Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And the Bible says when the foundation of the second temple was finally laid, all the workmen stepped back to look at the work that had been done. And the Bible says that the young men shouted for joy upon seeing the foundation of the second temple. But the older people, those who had seen the original temple while the younger crowd was shouting and celebrating, the older crowd sat back and wept because of how un, uh, un, unworthy, unequal, the second was to the first. Now, in this portion of Scripture, the temple has been complete. King Solomon has overseen the construction of the temple using a lot of the goods that his father David had laid up in store for him. It's complete. Solomon puts in place the choir. He puts in place the special singers. He's got the porters at the doors. He's got every detail looked after and seen to. 
And now at the dedication of that temple, he stands up and begins to pray to God. Look what it says in verse 1 of chapter 8. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. If we scroll on down, we get, to, uh, we get a little bit later in the chapter, we find that Solomon begins to pray unto God. He says this in verse, uh, in, in, in verse 26, And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on, on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. Man, what a humble Humble man Solomon was in this place of scripture. He wasn't always that way, but here he was. He looked at this magnificent temple that he had just built for God, and he says, even if I could have constructed the heavens and the heavens of the heavens, they would not be worthy. They would not be able to contain God. That's a pretty humble outlook, don't you think? Look what it says in verse 8. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall, not, or my name shall be there, and that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. He goes on to pray. He begins to ask God for mercy. Look at verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. Verse 35, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou mayest teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land which thou, givest, which, which, I, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. And then let's look at verse 37 and 38 before we pray. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locusts, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whosoever sickness there be, or sorry, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all the people, all thy people, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spreadeth forth his hands toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Now, Lord, we need your help. God, I have just a few minutes Lord, I want to use the, that time wisely. So God, please direct my thoughts, Lord. There's so many scriptures and th things I'd like to say in my mind right now. So Lord, would you please condense that down and have only that which would be in your perfect will spoken by my mouth. And then Father, I pray for every single person this morning. There is something in these verses to convict our hearts. Lord, please start at mine. God, I desire to leave this place closer to you than I was when I came in, more conformed to you. So God, please start at my heart, and then Lord, would you visit each and every single life in this room. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm convinced that there is a problem inside of man today. Uh, it, it's a problem that Solomon alludes to in this passage of Scripture. The problem is not the famine or blasting or locust or caterpillar mentioned in this verse. The, the, the problem is not drought. The problem, those are simple symptoms of the problem. 
Solomon says here in verse 38, he points out the problem. He says, though those things might afflict, afflict our entire land, he says, God, there may come a time when every man will bow his head and look how he describes what takes place in the prayer. He says in verse 38, he says, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward his house. Now I'm interested in a couple of words there in that verse. The first, ver the first word rather is plague. Many times we think of the word plague as an illness. I've heard people describe uh, COVID-19 as a plague. They've compared it to uh, the, the, the black plague and they've compared it to all these different illnesses. Uh, that would, according to the Bible, that might fit into the definition of the word plague, but the word, uh, uh, the word plague rather is used in a much more broad sense than just illness. If you'll notice there in verses 37 and 38, Solomon mentions a whole bunch of things and then sums it all up with the word plague. In fact, if you were to jump back into the uh, first five books of your Bible, you'll find that there were times when a plague was experienced by Israel. And it wasn't Ebola, it wasn't the cold, it was a something sent by God that would, uh, that, that would punish the people. There were people dying all over the place. So a plague is just simply the byproduct of something. Well, what is it? Well, Solomon says, Lord, there'll come a time when the corruptness, the, the wickedness of this nation will bring forth plagues upon the people. But God, when these people come to you as a whole or as individuals and they recognize the plague of their own heart, I think Solomon defined the human condition so perfectly in that phrase, the plague of the heart. Now, we hold our children and they're so precious, they're so sweet. My, my youngest is five going on six and I never, I never thought I'd, I'd be a kid person. Uh, I, that's just not, when I was a teenager, I didn't say, oh, I just want a bunch of babies. But I'm, I'm, I'm turning 40 in a couple of weeks and every time I'm around a baby now, the, the Ramirez little one, oh, at Missions Work Week, I couldn't, I couldn't do it because I would be thought of as a creep, but I wanted to go up and say, can I hold your baby? I just, you, you know what I'm talking, if you're, if you're like me, you know what I mean. We hold those children, they're precious. I love it when they fall asleep on me. Now, look, I'm not some kind of weirdo, but listen to me. How many of you use cloth diapers on your children? Raise your hands. Yeah, okay, so there's a few of you with me. There is nothing more precious to me than when Melody would get one of our children. Listen, we didn't use cloth diapers. I don't even know why we had cloth diapers, but there were times where she would give the children a bath and the smell of Johnson's, and Johnson, Johnson, what's it called? Johnson and Johnson baby wash. That on a soft baby wearing nothing but a diaper, when it first gets out of the bath, she would bring them to me and just give them to me. I love that. We don't like to think about what those little children can grow up into though, do we? I've got a 16 year old. I will tell you, the boy's got a plague of his heart. And it's not just him. It's part of the human being. As cute as those babies are when they're little. There's something inside of them that one day it's going to come out. Solomon, in dedicating the temple, I think it's very interesting. I don't know if you caught it or not. He's building this temple as a house for God. But while he's dedicating the temple, did you catch what he says? He says, will you, will you hear the prayer in heaven where you dwell? Solomon acknowledged that it was just a building. God didn't need a place to dwell. He already had that. But while he's dedicating that, that temple, he tells God, remember that these people are just humans. And in our wickedness and in our sin, God, if there's ever a time where these people find a little space for repentance, recognizing the plague of their heart, Lord, please hear their prayer. 
Now, find uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Hold your place there in, in, in 1 Kings. We'll come back there in, in a second. Find Proverbs chapter 4. We need to stop and think about this heart for a little while. Proverbs chapter 4. I want to give you three things about the heart real quick. Before we do, let me give you a couple of, couple of thoughts here from Proverbs. Proverbs, also written by Solomon, find in Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 19. I want you to listen to these words of wisdom from Solomon. He says, The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Then listen to this. My son... Attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, and keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and healeth, I'm sorry, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it, are the issues of life. This word heart, we find, is a very, very important thing. And there's a truth outlined here in this passage that, that I think is very, very helpful. I'd like, to, I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes addressing those who know for sure they're saved, and not just them, I suppose everybody, but then we'll go back to 1 Kings and find some things there for those that are lost. Hey, friend, the Bible the Bible makes much of the heart. Here, Solomon is encouraging his son. He's, and some say this is David speaking to Solomon. It doesn't really matter. But the father is talking to the son. He says, now, son, I want the best for you in this life. And so he says, he, what he doesn't say is, I'm going to give you money to help you in this life. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, now, I'm going to build you a house and make a home for you, and that'll help you in this life. That's not what he says. In fact, he's, he's emphasizing and pointing only to those teachings, those words of wisdom being imparted from a father to a son. So he says, first of all, attend unto my sayings. He says this there in, uh, in verse um, Verse 20 says, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. I, I, listen, I remember my dad and my mom saying, son, listen to me. So are, do you understand what I'm saying? And usually it was said in that tone and because I wasn't listening to what they were saying. But now I have children and I say the same thing. I'm like, listen to me, pay attention to what I'm saying. Here it's as though the, the father looks at his son and says, please attend to my words. In other words, be present at, hold on to, incline unto what I'm telling you. It's important that you hear this, but he doesn't stop there. And here's where parents mess up when it comes to the things of the Lord. We try to fill our kid's head with what they ought to know, forgetting about filling their heart with what they ought to know. We try to make our kids remember with their mind how they ought to live. We try to make them memorize scripture, but far too seldom do we, do we demonstrate to them the importance of having it in your heart. So he says, attend to my words, incline thine ear to my sayings, but let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. In other words, don't store my words just up here. Keep them, secure them in your heart. Why? What is the difference in the mind and the heart? Listen, you find throughout Scripture that what the heart longs for and craves, it convinces the mind to do. It, it's, come on, the easiest example of this is relationships, romantic relationships between young people. A mom and dad can tell their little girl, listen, you only need to be with a, with a Christian man. You need to be careful who you run with. You need, you need to watch out. There's trouble out there. And that little girl, that little girl can hear it and think about it and know what mom and dad say. But the moment her heart becomes attached to someone that she ought not be with, it does not matter what's up here. What's in here rules the day. So the father tells the son, Keep them in your heart. Lock them in there. Don't let them, don't let them escape. Keep it in your heart. 
Why? Well, look at the next verse. Verse 23, verse 22, rather, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. His father's telling his son these things because he understands that this son's, this son's life depends upon him remembering and keeping the words he's saying. I promise we're going somewhere. Stay with me. The next verse says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How about we teach that to ourselves? Keep your heart with all diligence. I, 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 we say, I love you with all my heart. We refer to the uh, love as being from the heart, and I think that's a I think that's a fair statement. I think it's accurate. I think it's beneficial sometimes to consider the words of the songs we sing. We sang songs this morning about love. My Jesus, I love thee. I don't know if you notice or not, but a couple of times in that song, the words are written and we sing them. But did you notice that it's not about a feeling that naturally comes from the heart? but it's about a decision that's made. I'll love thee in life. I'll love thee in death. You're saying it. Those words don't mean that you're going to naturally love him. It's a decision that you have to make. Why else would God tell husbands in Ephesians 5 to love their wives? If it just happened naturally, why would we need to be told to do it? God knows our heart. And if we leave it up to our heart to decide how we feel about something, oh, you've got trouble. You've got trouble. The Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. I wrote down just a few things the Bible says about the heart. I want you to, to listen to, to how important your heart is. You understand that the, the way people think and feel is based upon what they put in their heart. Let me give it to you very, very quickly this way. Three things about the heart. First of all, the, the power of the heart. The power of the heart. The Bible says uh, that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Jeremiah, listen to this. Jeremiah 20, verse 9 says this. Then, said, then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Jeremiah, here's what he said. I, Jeremiah was pouting in this portion of scripture. Jeremiah sat down and after all these chapters that we read about Jeremiah, the suffering and the mockery and the rejection, Jeremiah sits down and says, I'm done. God, I'm done speaking for you. Don't ask me to do anything else. I'm finished. I quit. God said, really? And Jeremiah says, I tried. The harder I tried to quit, something inside of me began to burn. What was it? Well, God had planted his word, not in his mind, but in his heart. And the word of God began to burn, began to stir up. And, and for long, Jeremiah said, I, I can't help it. I got to talk to somebody. I got to tell somebody. I, I've, I've got two preacher friends in my mind right now. Hey, listen, I believe if God, if, if, I don't know if it's the right word, and I don't know how I feel about the phrase called to preach. I think we're all called to go and preach the gospel. But those who are preachers, those who have a passion for it, those who God has appointed to that ministry, you know what it's like to not be able to preach for a while. Man, I just, oh, I just want to preach. Now, you're looking at me like, oh, that's just a preacher. Something preachers say. They just like to be in front of people. That's spoken like somebody who doesn't know what I'm talking about. Anyone who has ever experienced the joy that comes with declaring, thus saith the Lord, so the joy that comes with a lost soul hearing the word of God declared, whether it be by by, by yourself or somebody else, and that, that soul being converted, once you experience it, you're never satisfied till you see it again. We got lots of preachers in our church, and some of you don't like the fact that I give up so much pulpit time to let these guys preach, but I do that because I know what it's like to sit and think, oh, I've got something I just want to share with the people. No, 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 let, me, let me correct what I just said. Everything you want to say to the people does not need to be said to the people. Don't come to me and don't raise your hand and say, there's just something I want to say. Well, no, that's not how that works. 
But Jer- listen, the power of the heart is incredible. You know what kept Jeremiah going? You, you know what got him back in the fight? It was having the word of his father in his heart. And there was moments when he said, I quit. I'm done. Boy, it began to work him over. Before long, he said, I can't quit. Oh, I just got to tell somebody. I got to find one more person to preach to. The, the, the heart's a very powerful thing. What you have in your heart is important as well. There's the power of the heart, but then there's the content of the heart. The content of the heart. Listen to this. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. What's in your heart is so important. What are you filling your heart up with? What are you putting in? What are you allowing yourself to become attached to and and love? What is it? The content of the heart is so important. Psalm 119.11, you know why it's important? Here's why it's important. David had the word in his heart. Here's what he said. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. David recognized that the content that, 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 that which filled his heart would have an effect on how he, he fought spiritually. He said, if I want to stand against sin, I better have the right thing in this heart of mine. Hey, hey friend, let, let, everybody look right here. As Americans, we have more things for our heart available than a lot of people. We, have, we, we, we chalk our minds and our hearts so full of garbage. And I, listen, I, the internet's full of all kinds of immorality, and I, I could preach a whole message on that. We talk about the radio and the music, but let, let's talk about the things that largely are regarded as wholesome. How about news? There's been seasons in my life where I've had to ask God to forgive me for filling myself up with, with news more than his word. All things in moderation, right? What are you filling your head up with? I was kind of discouraged a, little, a few weeks ago um, about a conversation I heard take place uh, in, in the fellowship hall. I heard young people talking about a TV show. It's TV. I don't know what it's TV or Netflix. I don't know what it's on. I have no idea. I know what the show is. It's absolute garbage. Game of Thrones. That's what they're talking about. Hey, Christian, shame on you if you fill your head with that. Shame on you. You, 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 you put that in, in your mind and it filters its way down into your heart and before long your heart is dwelling on what you see in that stuff. Before long your, your heart begins to tell your mind, well, you know, that's not that bad. How do you know if it's right or wrong? You've never experienced it. Maybe you should try to experience it. And your heart is being filled with garbage. And before long you'll end up in a preacher's office saying things like, I don't know why, I just feel like God doesn't hear me. I don't know why I can't be more successful in my spiritual walk. I don't know why it's so hard for me to do right. I can tell you why. What have you filled your heart up with? David said, the key to me not sinning is to hide that word in my heart. Keep it right there. That same word that David says a little bit later, that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? Let me, let me explain to you from Scripture how important the contents of your heart really is. Now, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We, we understand the value of the, 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 uh, the power of the heart. Let, let, me, let, let me give you what the Bible says will come out of the heart. You, you behave, your demeanor, your, your attitude is a direct reflection of the contents of your heart. Listen to, listen to how... I wanted to use the word invasive, but that, that, that sounds really bad. Let me, listen to how prominent and effective the contents of the heart is into every area of life. This is just from Scripture. Let me give you a few of these. I won't get through the whole list. Second Chronicles chapter 7, we find that the heart can be merry. 
When someone is of a merry heart, it means their heart is happy. There's something in there that's causing them to be joyful. It spills over into the life. You have an upright in heart. How about wise in heart? The Bible refers to those who are hypocrites in heart. How do we find those that are broken in heart, backsliding in heart, proud in heart, rejoicing in heart, pure in heart, lowly in heart, integrity of the heart, gladness of the heart, subtle of heart, bitterness of heart, hardness of heart, purpose of heart, anguish of heart, and the list goes on and on. Do you understand why it's so important to keep your heart with all diligence? Watch violence and garbage on TV all day long and wonder why we're raising a generation of angry, lawless young people. Remember when peaceful protests used to mean walking down the street holding a sign? Remember that? Those days are gone. Those days are gone. What's happened? Someone's put something into the hearts of our children. It's causing some horrible, horrible effects. We see the value of the heart. We see the power of the heart, the content of the heart. Now go back to 1 Kings very quickly. So Christian, the heart's very important. I hope you understand that. Back in 1 Kings chapter 8... Starting in verse 31, Solomon begins to outline what causes these plagues of heart. We don't have time to read the whole passage again, but Solomon points out that there are some that forget God, some that will turn to idols, some that will do just, just different things. But at the end of the day, he says it's a plague of heart. And over and over again, he uses different examples, but over and over again, he, he points to the solution. And here's the solution. Repent. Repent. He says, God, now when the people do this or they do that and they have backslidden, when they call upon you and say, I have sinned, when they pray, will you hear their prayer? And when they confess their sin to you and they ask you for forgiveness, they want to repent, God, would you give them the grace for repentance? I'm so thankful that our God does not wad us up and throw us in the garbage every time we mess up and let him down. So, hey, we have made a disaster of so many Christians' lives by, by shaming them and putting them down there for, for every mistake they make. Can you imagine how different the body of Christ would be if we would treat the broken people the way God treats the broken people? Instead of shoving them out and saying, I knew you were going to be a failure, uh, come back when you get it all fixed. Instead of doing that, why can't we do what God does and say, yeah, you, you messed up. Uh, I, while I, I know all things and I knew you were going to mess up, I also knew that you would one day repent. I knew you would ask me for, for forgiveness. Come on back in. Let's make this right. Can you imagine what we would be like if we would stop treating Christians as though they're disposable and start giving them such value that we behave as though we can't live without them? That's what God does. So Solomon cries out to God and he says, Lord, if they turn back to you, this plague of their heart, God, will you do something with it? I love the crossover from that physical uh, that physical repentance there found in First, uh, First Kings. I love the crossover into the spiritual world. Hey, li listen, here's what, here's what Isaiah 53, 5 says. It says that by his stripes, we are what? Healed. Healed. Jesus says that Satan wants to come and pluck the seed of the gospel out of the hearts of those that hear it. And you know why he says he wants to do that? Lest they hear it, be converted, and he heal them. People are broken. People are sick. They, they've got a plague of heart. There's only one thing that can heal that plague. It's Jesus Christ. Those stripes 
that heal us according to Isaiah 53. Those are the, the, the stripes laid on him by the, by the whip. It's the blood that streamed down Calvary. It's the only healing that will reverse that plague. People are trying to heal that plague on their own, only to meet with eternal and disastrous results. I remember the day that I had that Israel moment that Solomon was speaking about. I was seven years old. Now, you may have been older or younger, but I was seven years old. And in Panama City, Florida, where we were living at the time, my mom sat down with me. I heard the, I'd heard it before. My mom had taught us the Bible. I had been in church. I, I heard it. But I'm telling you, my mom unfolded the gospel that day to me in a way that when I sat there and listened to her voice, it was as though God said, oh, here's a plague. Your heart is diseased. Spiritually, you're so ill, Adam. And mom began to say things like, Adam, you're a sinner. Here's what the Bible says. And Adam, you can't make yourself right. Here's what the Bible says. And Adam, there's only one way for you to be healed from this plague. Here's what the Bible says. I remember the day, and I didn't get saved that afternoon, but that evening, man, what mom had said was inside of me just churning me up. I came out of that bedroom late at night, found my dad in the living room reading his, reading his Schofield Bible, sitting in a recliner. I can still see it in my mind. That, I don't have great memory. I, have, I don't remember things well, but I remember that very well. Dad sitting there reading his Bible late at night, and I came down the hall. I think there was tears coming down my face by the time I got there. He said, son, what's wrong? I said, dad, I need to be saved. And I remember bowing my head and praying that prayer that Solomon talked about. God, I've sinned against you. God, please hear me and save me. I know the plague of my heart. Lord, would you heal me? Paul said it this way in Ephesians. He says that when we were dead in trespasses and sins, and here's what he says. You hath he quickened who were dead. You know, you know what I was? I was dead. That plague had killed me. Paul said in the book of Romans that the law slew me. I was dead. But one day I rested only in the stripes on the back of my Savior, and I found complete healing. He healed me. He healed me. Now, friend, you can close your Bibles as we're done, but please listen to what I say. You're here this morning, and no doubt in a crowd this size, there are people who know for sure they're saved. And if you do, I'm, I'm glad you do. There are people who no doubt in a crowd this size don't know for sure they're saved. There's people who no doubt know for sure they're not saved. Here's what I know for sure. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's every single one of us. That's the plague of our heart. But here's what the Bible says. It says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. It's, it's with the heart. And then with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Wouldn't it be awful to close your eyes in death on the earth only to open them in eternal death after this life. That's what the Bible says. It says the wages of your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Would you please stand to your feet and bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm speaking to every single person in this place this morning. I'm speaking to you while we're standing in a crowd and I'm looking at everybody as a whole. I want you to think of what I'm saying as being spoken to you personally. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning. What are you doing about the plague of your heart? The plague of your heart. 
You can try to heal yourself through good works. You can try to be a good neighbor and a good father or husband, whatever it might be. That's just trying to heal yourself, and you can't heal yourself. There's only one cure for the plague of your heart, and that is Jesus Christ. I was seven years old when I turned to him for my healing. This morning, it's time for you to turn to him for yours. What would keep you in that pew this morning? What would keep you from being saved from the plague of sin within your heart? Right now, even before the piano begins to play, right now, how about letting me pray for you, friend? Maybe you've heard it over and over again, just like I had as a, as a, as a little boy. But perhaps this morning, you're, you're ready now to confront it head on and really get serious about asking the question about your eternity. And if that's you this morning, and you'd let me pray for you, would you just slip your hand up? And you, by raising your hand, you'd be saying, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure that I've ever had this settled. Please pray for me, preacher. Would you raise your hand? Would you let me pray for you? Would you raise it right now? Thank you. I see that hand. Somebody else, you say, preacher, please pray for me. I've heard it, but this morning it hit me differently. Preacher, please pray for me. Perhaps you're here this morning and you'd be honest enough as you examine your heart and you consider what you're filling your heart up with. Maybe you're honest enough to say, I've got some work to do. If the issues of life really come forth out of my heart, then I've got some work to do. There's folks at the altar praying right now. Maybe you ought to join them at the altar right now. Why don't you come? There's folks moving. What are you waiting on? Wouldn't it be something if on this Sunday of this year, you point back to this day and say, that's when I got my heart right with God. I got rid of those things that ought not be there. I gave those up that day, and boy, I'm glad I did. I started hiding his word in my heart. Father, I've done my best this morning. Lord, I pray that you take these very simple thoughts. God, the, the expressions on people's faces and the hands raised are evidence that you've touched hearts. And Lord, please continue the work. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Just stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Miss Lord, we'll play something on the piano. The altar's open. What is your need this morning? Would you come? Would you come? Hey, mom and dad, your children need you to have a heart full of the Word of God. A heart full and right with God. Hey, grandparents, you might be the only hope your grandchildren have. How you doing on it? How you doing on it? Page 57 in your hymn book is Cleanse Me. Let's sing that together. Page 57, Brother Dowdy's going to lead us in a verse or two. Don't let the hymn book in your hand keep you in your pew. If you need to come, you come as we sing on the first, page 57. Search me, O God, and second verse. Let's sing it together. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure with 
Quietly, if you would, while the piano plays. Some still dealing with the Lord here at the altar. <laughs> 